Good morning. This is your philosophy class, philosophy 333, social philosophy online, and <clears throat> being brought to you through the kind auspices of Brother Damien. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> um, a couple of unfinished business things from um, before the midterm break. Uh, for, uh, I wrote them down. Um, <clears throat> we have a couple items from Hegel that we have to take up before we plunge into Marx. Also, uh, I have some, some of the tests left over of, from students who failed to pick them up on the Friday before the spring break. Now, what I can do, um, you can send me an email uh, with your address, and I will send them to you by snail mail. And then uh, one final thing. Don't forget your paper. Remember your paper? It's due on, I think it's April 15th. You might check your trusty syllabus to see what is involved with that. Um, and you might, before you actually do it, you might want to think in terms of getting a little bit into Marx before you actually write the thing. But be thinking of a topic, right? In other words, the, the topic for the paper is some historical event and what would be Hegel's, a political perspective, and Marx's, an economic perspective. So what your paper is about is taking the viewpoint of the political toward a particular historical event, and that's your choice. And you know where to find the historical events. They're on, they're on the internet. <laughs> Type in some historical event that you might be interested in, do, in writing about, and then um, consider the political perspective of it and the economic. One thing you might do is run it past me. In other words, send me an email uh, with your topic uh, to make sure it's feasible, plausible, whatever. Right? Um, <clears throat> I mean, there, uh, there are, in other words, don't write on God <laughs> from an economic or political perspective. You could write on religion various aspects of religions. But <clears throat> anyway, I'll leave that to you. So uh, be thinking of a topic and maybe uh, send me an email with your topic and uh, in other words, run it by me. Okay, today what we want to take a look at is um, Hegel's views regarding poverty, right? In other words, when a society is faced with poverty, uh, what does it do, right? And <clears throat> it happens to societies, in societies, and to societies. And um, the, um, it, uh, in our textbook from Hegel, in our collection of selections from Hegel, um, we have uh, on page 279, right, um, <clears throat> Hegel says, Society has the right and duty of acting as trustee to society, right? And, um, <clears throat> okay, over on page 280. Not only caprice, in other words, there are, there are, there are happenings, there are, well, there are various possibilities that may cause poverty. Well, caprice, Think of the coronavirus. <laughs> Not only caprice, however, but also contingencies, uh, wars, physical conditions, some kind of natural disaster, and factors grounded in external circumstances may reduce men to poverty. Um, <clears throat> the poor still have needs common to civil society 
And yet, since society has withdrawn from them the natural means of acquisition and broken the bond of the family in the wider sense of clan, um, you might think in terms of what happened toward the end of the feudal age in Europe when all of a sudden uh, many of the trades uh, were no longer um, able to support an individual. Think in terms of what happened, especially like in England, um, and <clears throat> where you had um, people moving from the farm to the city in order to get jobs, and where the professions had pretty much broken down. Um, <clears throat> or certainly the, what were called the guilds in the Middle Ages. <clears throat> okay, uh, the wider sense of the clan. Their poverty leaves them more or less deprived of all the advantages of society. Well, unless you haven't got money, if you haven't got any money, or if you haven't got an occupation which is able to produce a livelihood, you have not got the means to really participate in the advantages of society. The opportunity of acquiring skill or education of any kind. Well, one of the problems with education, uh, as Hegel has always insisted, is education makes unequal. Right? Education does not, it's not, uh, it's not, that doesn't level the playing field. Rather, it makes some, it, it gives some people an advantage, in other words, those, the, the rich who can send their uh, offspring to um, a private school or some uh, very good institution um, and those who cannot. And, um, <clears throat> uh, okay, the, as well as the administration of justice, well, as we uh, indicated earlier, in, in talking about uh, crime and the, the criminal, the, th those who are with wealth are able to hire a good lawyer, whereas those without wealth uh, are reduced to the public defender, uh, someone just out of law school, <clears throat> quite often. And, okay, uh, public health services. Well, the, the, uh, the current coronavirus problem um, relative to education one has to remember that um, students in the elementary school, middle school, and sometimes even high school, uh, depend upon the meals that they, especially the poor, depend on the meals that they receive from in, in, the, in the schools, for example, breakfast or lunch. And so uh, what's going to happen to them, uh, the state is going to have to enter into the picture and pre uh, give the meals which the schools are no longer able to give to those who are poor. Um, <clears throat> public health services. And often even the consolations of religion and so forth. Well, you have to remember that there are certain religions, who, um, even in the United States, that charged pew rents. Right? In other words, you had to, <clears throat> you had to Basically, the family had to buy a pew. And uh, that, of course, cost money, while the poor would be unable even to have the consolations of religion. Anyway, uh, incidentally, that's the, the free Methodists. Those were the Methodists that did not charge pew rent. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> anyway, the public authority takes the place of the family where the poor are concerned. Um, <clears throat> normally family, and especially the larger family, uh, may contribute to the problem of poverty within the family. Right. Um, where the poor are concerned, in respect not only of their immediate want, uh, but also of laziness of disposition, malignity, and other vices which arise out of their plight and their sense of wrong. Well, we have to remember <clears throat> um, malignity, uh, drunkenness as the cause of poverty, you, which was one of the reasons for the 
uh, passing the prohibition um, amendment in, uh, I think it was 29 or right, right around then. And um, it was because of the, the, the the families that were reduced to penury because the father of the family was given to demon rum. Actually, it wasn't demon rum. More often than not, it was hard cider. <laughs> anyway, back to our story. Um, poverty and, in general, the distress of every kind to which every individual is exposed from the start of the, the, in the cycle of his natural life has a subjective side, right? In other words, we're dealing with individuals. Um, <clears throat> and which demands similarly subjective aid to individuals, um, arising both from the special circumstances of a particular case and also from love and sympathy, right? In other words, one must not necessarily presuppose that it is the state that is going to have to step in and do this. Um, you have various civic organizations, such as, for example, United Way, to which uh, people and corporations and businesses can contribute in order to take care of broader social needs. Um, okay. Um, and of course, almsgiving is presupposed as part of the solution to poverty in a particular society, um, <clears throat> according to Hegel. When civil society is in a state of unimpeded activity, in other words, when things are going well, it is engaged in expanding internally in population and industry. The GDP goes up. Um, the amassing of wealth is intensified by generalizing, one, the linkage of men by their needs. In other words, the, um, the, society, the division of labor is working well and everybody is, is profiting by it. And B, the methods of preparing and distributing the means to satisfy these needs because it is from this double process of generalization that the largest profits are derived. Okay. That's one side of the picture. In other words, society is humming along, hmm? <clears throat> um, which at the present time, it's kind of, there's a certain amount of dissonance, as, we'll, as we know. That is one side of the picture. Everything is humming along. The economy and society is prospering. Um, the, the rich, of course, are getting richer, but the poor are not necessarily getting poorer. The other side of the picture is the subdivision and restriction of particular jobs, okay? In other words, um, per, there are particular occupations that are, for example, dangerous, inherently dangerous. and. Um, uh, one requires governmental agencies to make sure that safe, safety regulations are uh, in place. Um, I think the Department of Labor, uh, OSHA, O-S-H-A, OSHA. O -S -H -A, OSHA um, Office of, I forget what it is. Anyway, OSHA. Um, they are concerned with safety in the workplace. Okay, um, uh, which is can be associated with particular jobs. This results in the dependence and distress of the class tied to work of that sort. Um, um, in other words, there are inherently dangerous op occupations, and the the uh, you need agencies in the government. Um, well, uh, if you're injured at uh, work, there's a state departmental agency which um, uh, can take care or can either help you get over the problem or provide funds for you to uh, live with it. <clears throat> um, and these entail uh, inability to feel and enjoy the broader freedoms and especially the intellectual benefits of civil society. There's, there's not only what we might call physical poverty. There's also intellectual and cultural poverty. 
Uh, one sees this especially, or I saw it, especially in rural India, right? Uh, in other words, one of the reasons why people were, were moving um, to the cities, which were already oversized, overcrowded, and in which poverty was literally at the street level, that's where people slept, not only lived, but slept. Anyway, the, <clears throat> um, one of the reasons why the extremely poor in rural India were moving to these big cities was because of the cultural poverty of the city, of those villages, right? There was, <clears throat> and there was also precious little of education going on there too in many cases. So uh, in other words, and that was, that was the case also in uh, rural China. So but uh, <clears throat> OK. Um, when the standard of living of a large mass of people falls below a certain subsistence level. Um, I think the poverty level the last time I saw or heard it uh, quoted was about $30,000 a year. And um, if you fell below that, you were down into the poverty level. Um, uh, a level regulated automatically as the, as the one necessary for a member of society. In other words, the, the, the state determines and um, provides statistics um, that will indicate exactly what a normal family needs in order to live on. Um, <clears throat> and when there is a consequent loss of the sense of right and wrong, hmm, uh -oh, that's also one of the problems in, with poverty. Um, the um, uh, right and wrong becomes a little fuzzy. Of honesty and the self-respect which makes a man insist on maintaining himself by his own work and effort. The result is the creation of a rabble of paupers, right? In other words, people who are well below the poverty line. At the same time, this brings with it, at the other end of the social scale, conditions which greatly facilitate the concentration of disproportionate wealth in a few hands, right? In other words, inequality. Right? <clears throat> uh, um, a wide swath, a wide gap between the very rich and the very poor. And uh, um, times of inequality exist in almost every society at different times in its history. Um, the, um, when the masses begin to decline into poverty, the burden of maintaining them at their ordinary standard of living might be directly laid on the wealthier classes. Well, it's obvious. If you've got this disproportionate level between the wealth of the wealthy and the poverty of the poor, what do you do? Well, you redistribute <laughs> the wealth. <clears throat> In other words, take the wealth, uh, soak the rich, to put it simply. <clears throat> That's one solution, right? Um, or they might receive the means of livelihood directly from other public sources of wealth, uh, from the endowments of rich hospitals. Now, that sounds nice. <clears throat> and of course, there are uh, parts of any country where the, some of the hospitals are richer than those in other parts of the country. <clears throat> Uh, in fact, in some rural areas, they're having trouble keeping hospitals open. <clears throat> um, okay, monasteries, ah yes. Monasteries were, one could always go to the monastery and get, um, they were, you might say, the, uh, the soup kitchens of the Middle Ages, right? And you could, and you could stay overnight, right? Be sheltered from the, um, cold and the rain and the snow. Um, so, um, uh, rich hospitals, monasteries, and other foundations, right? Well, there are foundations which support sometimes 
the poor. In either case, however, the needy would receive sustenance, substance, subsistence directly, not by means of their work. Remember, for Hegel, as for Marx, work creates identity. So if you don't have work, you don't have a feeling of, well, worth, right? So in other words, that's one of the that's one of the sad parts of poverty. Uh, the it's it's you, it, one develops a poverty of spirit, um, and this would violate the principle of civil society, or certainly Hegel's principle of civil society, and the feeling of individual independence and self-respect in its individual members. Right? If you haven't got any work, you haven't got an identity. Hmm which is not, yeah. As an alternative, they might be given subsistence indirectly through being given work. Well, if you recall during, no, you don't recall, it's before your time, um, and it's a bit before my time, but I do remember parts of it. During the Depression in the 30s, uh, the government provided work. Um, I remember, these men used to come by with these big trucks and shovels and clean the gutters. It was the WPA. Um, Works Project Administration. Uh, and uh, it provided work for people who were out of work. And, um, uh, and it also kept the cities clean. Um, I remember something similar in Italy right after the Second World War. Uh, there was a great deal, you'd see these people with these brooms, basically. They looked like witches' brooms, right? And they were sweepy, kept the streets clean. <laughs> and they also hired them, uh, okay, they also hired them um, as the CCC in the, in the United States during the Depression to produce cultural works, right? Um, the CCC are responsible for, um, I, forget the, uh, I forget the exact meaning of what, what CCC stands for, but anyway, the, you had the, the trail system in our um, mountains and hills, uh, was, they were, it was built largely by the CCC, right? And, uh, uh, <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, and, and for example, in Italy, um, the, this, it even supported uh, the similar uh, governmental agencies of uh, supported symphony orchestras, right? And um, you, the CCC in the United States, I think it also, it had an arts component, right? And in other words, there was a, a lot of, you could get a, a grant from the CCC to um, do a mural somewhere. Right. Um, okay, back to our story. <clears throat> uh, as an alternative, they might be given subsistence indirectly through being given work, uh, the opportunity to work. In this event, the volume of production would be increased. Uh-oh. Remember, what's the cause of poverty for Hegel? The cause of poverty for Hegel, boom, boom. The cause of poverty for Hegel is overproduction. So if you get the government involved in production, whatever kind of work they're, they're competing with the private sector, right? So it's, are you helping this, are you solving the problem? Well, <laughs> this whole, lecture, what is it about? Does Hegel solve the problem of poverty? Right? And you can uh, take, you could move it just a little further. Do we solve the problem? How do we try to solve the problem? And that's probably the better word. Why do we try to solve the problem of poverty? Whether we ever succeed, in, well, what is it? I think uh, uh, Johnson, wasn't it President Johnson had the war on poverty? Oh, great. Did he win the war? Back to our story. 
I'll leave that question hanging. You can answer it yourself. In, okay, the excess of production and in the, in the lack of a proportionate number of consumers, right? In other words, you need, if you've got overproduction, you need more consumers. Well, if you've got poverty, they can't consume. They haven't got any money. Okay, number of consumers who are left, who are, there, or who are themselves also producers. And thus, it is simply intensified by both of the methods. A and B, by which it is sought to alleviate it, right? And what are the A and B were? Uh, maintaining people in, in other words, soaking the rich. Well, of course, nobody's got any money. And, or what was B? Well, B was uh, uh, being given work, right? Well, that's not, neither, neither one is going to work, right? Um, it hence becomes apparent that despite an excess of wealth, in other words, no matter how wealthy the, 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 the government may be, no matter how wealthy the society may be, better, um, the uh, civil society is not rich enough, right? <laughs> so if you ask the question, does Hegel solve the problem of poverty? Is there a solution to the problem of poverty? And you'd probably have to say, society is not rich enough. Hmm. That is, its own resources are insufficient to check excessive poverty and the creation of a penurious rabble. Well, what was England's solution to the penury, the problem, and the penurious rabble. Well, what did they do with the debtors? They put them in the debtors prison. And when the debtors prison got too full, what did they do with them? Put them on a ship to one of the colonies. Which colony? Australia. Hmm? That's, that's a solution. Export the problem. <laughs> Okay, well anyway, that's enough, I'm tired. We'll do, we'll do this again, uh, we'll do this again on uh, Wednesday. So let's quit. Oh, one other thing, one more thing. At the end of a Roman letter, they always, the, the, person wrote Ave, Atque, Vale, Hail and Farewell. And, or in modern terminology, um, may the Moodle be with you. <laughs>